Hello, I'm Jonathan Dean, Seattle Opera Dramaturg. La Traviata might be the most popular opera of all time. I think I read somewhere that ever since La Traviata caught on in the 1850s, this opera has been performed somewhere in the world every night. Not sure how a claim like that could ever be verified, but it sounds plausible. It's one of those shows when people who've never been to an opera attend La Traviata, they tend to go, oh, so that's where that's from. La Traviata seems like the most bread and butter of operas, the dictionary definition of opera, the status quo of the art form as it has existed for the last 150 years. But actually, life is change. You can put something in a museum, call it a classic, and hang on to it for a long time, but the world will change around it, and it whatever you're putting into deep freeze, probably emerged out of change and growth. The masterpieces in any artistic tradition are usually the ones that break the rules, that explore new possibilities, and make us rethink everything we thought we knew. La Traviata opened a door when it was created in 1853. It was the fulcrum of the life and career of its composer, Giuseppe Verdi, it's the transition from romanticism into realism in terms of how stories were told in the 19th century in the West. And it changed how people thought about gender, sex, and love. Let's investigate those three turning points as we get ready this spring for La Traviata at Seattle Opera. To understand how Verdi's life and lifestyle changed around the time he composed La Traviata, it's important to know a little bit about him and where he came from. I've always related powerfully to the story of Verdi's life. I grew up in suburban middle America in the Reagan years, but as a young adult, moved to the big diverse city to get a job working in the arts. Verdi grew up in a remote bit of farmland in Northern Italy, in the Duchy of Parma, where they make Parmesan cheese, Napoleon's French Empire had been expanding for a generation, spreading across Europe the liberal reforms associated with the French Revolution. But when Verdi was born in 1813, the pendulum started swinging back toward traditional power structures, monarchies, local aristocracies, the church. All Verdi's life, he negotiated back and forth between the blue and the red, between progressive liberal people and ideas, the world of the big city opera houses, and Paris in particular, and more conservative traditional forces, the rural Catholic world where he'd grown up. Can't call it Italy, because that country didn't exist until he created it. As a musician and composer, young Verdi faced a choice. He, two roads were diverging in a yellow wood. He could go into church music, stay near his home and family, and live a modest life of virtuous humility in a conservative milieu. Or he could go into the big bad world and make a fortune composing operas. He moved to the big sinful city, Milan, got to know liberals, intellectuals, and all the movers and shakers of the arts world, and became the hottest thing in opera. Verdi spent his 30s scurrying up and down the Italian peninsula, writing operas for Naples, Rome, Florence, Milan, Venice, making money, but, at least in the opinion of the folks back home, becoming intimate with questionable characters. When Verdi composed La Traviata, he was turning 40. He had just moved back to the small town where he had grown up, with his friend Giuseppina Strepponi. She had been a famous soprano about 10 years earlier. In fact, she starred in Verdi's first great operatic triumph and mentored this greenhorn fresh from the country as he entered the arts world and high society. Strepponi's stressful life was rough on her voice. 
And by the time she turned 35, she was a little younger than Verdi, her days as a diva were pretty much over. She was actually transitioning into a second career as a voice teacher up in liberal Paris, when suddenly she sacrificed all that to move with Verdi back to the sticks. It didn't go well. Straponi was considered a fallen woman. She'd had kids, but she hadn't ever been married. So in Verdi's small town, she was ostracized. They wouldn't let her in the church, nobody would see her socially, and she risked getting heckled or even having stones thrown at her if she went out and about. At one point in here, Verdi, who was a widower, and Straponi had traveled back to Paris. Verdi's beloved father-in-law, Antonio Barrezzi, wrote him a harsh letter. Verdi's response was strong and stubborn. In my house, there lives a free, independent lady. Neither I nor she owes any explanation for our actions to anyone. Who knows whether she is or is not my wife? Who knows what reasons we have for not making that public? Who knows whether it is good or bad? Why could it not also be good? And if it were bad, who has the right to pronounce anathema upon us? In my house, people owe her the same respect owed to me, or even greater. Less than two weeks after writing that letter, Verdi went to the theater to see the play that was the talk of Paris that season, The Lady of the Camellias by Alexandre Dumas, According to Verdi, he started composing the music of La Traviata on the way back to his hotel from the performance of the play that inspired it. La Traviata was a very personal opera for Giuseppe Verdi. The tenor character in the story, Alfredo Germont, is a naive young man torn between his love for this fallen woman. Actually, La Traviata means the woman who strayed from the path, and his relationship with his conservative bourgeois father, who comes up to Sin City, in this case, Paris, from the Sleepy South, to rescue his boy from all these fast, flashy people. But the opera isn't about Alfredo. He's a stand-in for Verdi and for us in the audience, an ordinary person who witnesses the tragic story of this remarkable traviata, this off-roading woman. She's called Violetta Valérie in the opera. For Verdi, the free and independent lady was Giuseppina Streponi. Verdi made an honest woman, as they say, of Streponi when they finally got married seven years later. But when they first moved in together, she made a great artist of him. Verdi had achieved fame and fortune early on in his career by giving the opera-going public pretty much what they liked, what they expected, with extra intensity here and there. Mostly, he aimed to please. But his experience supporting Straponi against the people of his conservative hometown taught him how to stand his ground and trust himself, how to fly in the face of convention or of tradition, how to do what he wanted to do or what he thought was right, even when it ruffled feathers. It's at this point in his career that with each new opera he writes, he just hits the ball out of the park. Rigoletto, Il Trovatore, La Traviata. Traviata was his 18th opera. He'd written lots of shows that don't get performed much nowadays, what we call early Verdi. He later referred to that period of his career as his galley slave years. There's wonderful music in some of them, but as musical drama, they pale in comparison with what he created later on. I'll tell you a little about how they're different, why they improved, has to do with his love for Straponi and the confidence she gave him in his own artistic voice. I wanna look at three elements of opera so I can show you the improvement with La Traviata. Let's talk about structure, color, and the relationship of words and music. Structure. Italian opera in those days was very much a cookie cutter, assembly line kind of enterprise. The reason people like Rossini and Donizetti could crank out an opera in two weeks is there were a lot of prefab structures. Cavatinas, cabalettas, similar duets, dissimilar duets, ensemble strattas. Composing an opera was a little like a paint by numbers kit 
where with a tiny bit of new musical inspiration, you could mostly repeat what worked last time, but come up with a new full-length show. In La Traviata, Verdi occasionally uses the old traditional forms, but when he does so, it's for purposes of plot and character, not just because of musical logic. Good example is the traditional Cavatina Cabaletta structure at the end of Act One. Any principal singer in an Italian opera in those days expected to sing a scena, that is, a double aria. First, the slow cavatina, then, a, after a mood change, the up-tempo cabaletta. Verdi had written dozens of these conventional numbers. Violetta's big scene consists of, first, the timid, melancholy A force et lui, followed by the manic fluttering of Sempre Libra. Sempre libra. So yes, a standard Cavatina Cabaletta structure, but it's also the most brilliant and intense psychodrama. This woman, who's been stuck in this self-destructive party girl lifestyle for years, has just received an ardent declaration of love from a sweet, naive young man, this greenhorn rube from the sticks. She asks herself first, do I deserve this? What would happen if I tried to slow down and take it seriously for once? And she answers, no, I'm a party girl. Commitment ties you down, it's not for me. So slow, fast, sure, the musical form suits the moods of the text, but Verdi subverts the form in both movements, the slow part and the fast part, by bringing back music we heard earlier in the opera. Alfredo's passionate cry of love is still echoing in Violetta's mind. His is the tune she can't get out of her head. <laughs> So, structure, the relation of the parts to the whole, deployed for greater theatrical intensity, dramatic representation of a person at war with herself than any Cavatina Cabaletta previously written. With La Traviata, there's also a breakthrough in terms of color. Actually, the word Verdi used was tinta, tint. What does that mean in this context? Well, there's a danger with the paint-by-numbers system used to create operas so quickly, all those operas can sound alike. It, it's a nice sound, but how do you tell one opera from another if they've all been generated using prefab forms? Or if, like Rossini and Donizetti, you sometimes cut an aria from one opera and paste it into another, like one of those subdivisions where all the houses are identical. Wait, which one do I live in? Verdi improved on this system by developing the concept of tinta. What it means is basically each opera should sound like itself. Each opera has its own sound world. Nabucco doesn't sound like Macbeth, which doesn't sound like La Traviata, which doesn't sound like Aida. Verdi set La Traviata musically in the glittering world of mid-19th century Paris high society by writing plenty of waltzes.
that's the color, the tinta of La Traviata, the musical vocabulary specific to that show. That was new in the 1850s. One other thing I want to mention, and that's the relationship between music and words. Always an issue and always the fascination of opera. Verdi strove to achieve what he called le parole scenique, a theatrical use of words, where the music doesn't quite work without the words, the words don't quite work without the music, but when you put them together, you get this nuclear reaction and the fusion of words and music is way more powerful than either could be separately. It's easier to recognize than to explain. At what point in the following passage does Violetta stop hemming and hawing and simply use le parole scenique, words fused with music, to communicate her message? powerful scene. And I'm sure at the first performance, people in 1853 were thinking, what is going on? Because no one had ever heard anything like that before. Verdi first made a name for himself as an opera composer by following the patterns and satisfying expectations. But after he settled down with Straponi, his operas became more bold, more adventurous. He was forever battling censorship. Government censors controlled everything that appeared on stage in those days, and Verdi was always pushing it, always trying to sneak in his radical message, whether that was free Italy, or down with the tyrants, or hashtag me too, or even centering black lives in his operas. What was the radical message of La Traviata? It was the exact same message as that letter to his father-in-law. You need to show the so-called fallen woman the same respect you show me, or even more. Another member of the family had complained that Verdi shouldn't flaunt his prostitute in their faces. Straponi wasn't a prostitute, and neither was Violetta Valéry. She was a courtesan. There's a difference. With a courtesan, it's more than sex, although that's part of it. It's grace and elegance, sparkling conversation, skill, the ultimate in refinement and societal accomplishment. Courtesans were celebrities. Many of them were or had been celebrities on stage in show business. Men pursued them and gave them money in exchange for sex and to cash in on that celebrity and status. If Marie Duplessis appeared in public on the arm of Baron so-and-so, well, he must be somebody we should take seriously. Duplessis was famous for always wearing a camellia a white camellia if she was available. Five days a month, she wore a red camellia. Some of the better known courtesans of 19th century Paris.
courtesan was an independent woman, in other words, someone not considered to be the property of her father, brother, or husband. Somebody with her own bank account. Yes, she was a sexually active, unmarried person, usually engaged in what we might call serial monogamy. In Paris, that wasn't a big no-no, the way it was back in rural Italy. Verdi found the Parisian approach more real, more human. In fact, he had miscalculated three years before La Traviata when his opera Stifelio flopped. That's a beautiful opera, but it's about a man who publicly forgives his wife for cheating on him, and the original audience just couldn't go there. They weren't ready for La Traviata either, but La Traviata is an even stronger opera. It's irresistible. Verdi's music manipulates us into following with sympathy and interest the story of this strong, complex, independent, doomed, fallen woman. Another way Verdi pushed the envelope with La Traviata and tried something that nobody had ever done before was this was a story of today. La Traviata was absolutely contemporary. Verdi even asked the theater where Traviata premiered to set the opera in contemporary dress. They refused to do so. All operas at the time had historical settings. Verdi got really angry, and actually the first production set in the Paris of Louis XIV was a dud. Verdi didn't write any more operas with contemporary settings, but La Traviata pointed the way toward a new kind of here and now realism in operatic storytelling. Opera has always had an element of, let's leave reality behind and go to this strange universe where everybody sings all the time. Originally, that worked well because all opera plots came from ancient myth or antiquity, so opera didn't look like regular modern life. Even in the years just before Verdi, half the fun of going to opera was how it usually took place a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, this exotic and colorful allure of romantic era opera. At the time, there was a craze sweeping Europe for historical fiction, the novels of Sir Walter Scott, for instance. Opera followed that fad by offering stories full of quaint local color, fabulous processions and celebrations and interrupted wedding scenes. But many of those romantic era operas don't offer much by way of complex human character or rich psychological detail. That starts coming in with La Traviata. I have a neat illustration of this shift in storytelling within one literary family. The play that inspired La Traviata, The Lady of the Camellias, was written by Alexandre Dumas' Fils. You have to say Fils, son or junior, to differentiate him from his father, Alexandre Dumas' père. He was the author of such beloved romantic era fictions as The Three Musketeers, The Man in the Iron Mask, The Count of Monte Cristo, all those great swashbucklers that are so much fun and so ridiculous. Verdi had written 17 operas, all that kind of romantic fiction. You suspend your disbelief in how crazy the plot is because you're having such a good time looking at colorful sets and costumes, watching fight scenes, and listening to all this great music. Verdi's opera that premiered two months before La Traviata, Il Trovatore, belongs to that earlier kind of romantic fiction. Over the top, exaggerated, colorful, fantastic, but not realistic. With its almost autobiographical source text by Dumas Fils, La Traviata would be the most realistic opera Verdi ever wrote. He had been to those parties in Paris. He had had those tearful conversations with family members. He had even written the entertainments they enjoy in that world. There's a big production number in Act Two of La Traviata, sort of an opera within an opera, where the chorus sing about Romany fortune tellers and bullfighters celebrating the romantic allure of exotic Spain. Well, Verdi had just done that himself in Il Trovatore. That scene pokes fun at his own most recent opera. Verdi keeps the La Traviata chorus in the background, stylized and a bit surreal. In real life, people don't behave like opera choruses. But people really do behave like that scene I showed you earlier where she's saying one thing but thinking another, 
flustered because he has surprised her, miserable because she's chosen to dump him even though she still loves him, stressed because she doesn't know how to do it, panicking because she knows how much this is going to hurt him, and finally it all explodes in that mighty cry of, ah, mommy, Alfredo. When it came to creating vivid characters as complex and puzzling as real human beings, with Violetta, Verdi created a character worthy of his idol Shakespeare or of real life. Verdi liked writing operas about strong female characters. Early in his career, when he was writing all those over-the-top romantic swashbuckler operas, he had a penchant for depicting fearsome and bellicose women, such as Abigaile in Nabucco, the role created by Straponi. Odebella, who leads the warrior women of Italy against Attila the Hun in Attila. Scariest of all, Lady Macbeth. Not even a play of the vocal music for that one. Verdi insisted he wanted a singer with an ugly voice to portray this terrifying character. He went even further with Macbeth's witches. Whereas Shakespeare had used three witches, Verdi filled his stage with witches, divided his female chorus in three. The man loved witches. Two other Verdi heroines predating La Traviata get accused of witchcraft, Joan of Arc and Azucena in Il Trovatore. And Verdi would write other witch characters later on. So yeah, he had always been drawn to female characters who don't conform to cliches about the weaker sex or the passive damsel in distress. Problem is, warrior women and witches can also be cliches. If you want to portray a real person, you've got to go beyond simple cliché. At first glance, people sometimes make erroneous assumptions about each other. When Alfredo's father first pushes his way into Violetta's home in La Traviata Act II, he assumes she's a femme fatale, a sexually voracious woman determined to consume and destroy his naive son. About two lines into that scene, old Germont realizes to his surprise that, no, that's not Violetta at all. This woman is young, dignified, beautiful, powerful, and independent. In fact, she's paying for Alfredo's comfortable lifestyle. She is strong, but she's weak. Violetta suffers from tuberculosis, AKA the romantic disease, a malady associated at that time with sensitive, passionate, artsy types. In fact, uh, within a decade or so, Violetta herself became the prototype of a new cliche the beautiful, frail woman with flushed cheeks coughing herself to death on her Victorian swooning couch. But just because she's sick doesn't mean she's weak. Consider the complex drama of the big party scene concertante. Alfredo throws a wad of money in Violetta's face, insulting her to get back at her for dumping him. She responds with this music.
strong female character? At first glance, that scene seems to be about pitying this poor, weak woman, pathetic in her public humiliation. But look closer, a lot of layers here. A strong drama tends to be about inverting values. What was up turns out to be down. What was wrong is actually right. Why is she singing love music at this point? As far as Violetta is concerned, rejecting Alfredo was how she proved her love. Letting him go was the greatest gift she could give him. She made a strong choice at the end of Act One when she put aside her party girl mask and committed to him alone. Here, she completes her transformation into a fully mature three-dimensional person by offering up their relationship as a sacrifice for what she thinks will be the greater good. Like Verdi and Straponi, Violetta and Alfredo change each other. They mature because of each other. Their love transforms them. That's what this opera is about. Actually, they predicted that when that familiar drinking song in the first scene became a duet. Violetta might not wave a sword around, but she is one of Verdi's strongest female characters. Her strength is in her choices, to love someone and to set him free. Love turns out to be suffering and sacrifice, but it gives her life its meaning. A new kind of strong female character for Giuseppe Verdi, and a new way of representing love beyond the old cliches. Romanticism gives way to realism, and Verdi the craftsman transforms into Verdi the artist. Thanks be to love. La Traviata is Verdi's most realistic opera. He had himself experienced everything that happens in this show. Many of us have. It's reality. Wondrous thing about Verdi is how he transformed life into this masterful song of love and death. See you at La Traviata.